Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome to The Right Mindset. I'm Thomas J. Beleza, and today I'm here with author uh, Arwen Dawn, uh, author of 111 Magic. She's decided to come join us. There's her book. Look at that. Even It even just stands up on its own. It, it, it's magically floating. She is not <laughs> holding the book. It is. It, <laughs> it's positive. She has magnets in it, and she uses... Uh, I, I just gave away the magic trick, and I apologize for that. A magician never reveals the secret. That's right, but Penn and Teller do. No. Oh yeah, that's true. Uh, I, I'm really great that you. I'm really grateful that you decided to come on. You're uh, connected to one of my close friends, uh, uh, Aurora, uh, from uh, Katura, uh, uh, from uh, the amazing uh, food company. Uh, she's been a guest on here as well many a times, and uh, so I like to keep it close in the family, like a nice little circle. So. Uh, let's see what we can do today. Maybe, maybe we can entertain the audience. Hope so. Uh, I don't yeah. juggle, but <laughs> well, they also like silence, though. Sometimes they just want to, you know, because you're distracting me from writing. That's what they say to us. I'm like, <laughs> why are you listening then? Why, why are you? I don't have music playing. <laughs> Anyhow, so uh, yeah, so you, you jumped on the show, and uh, you have a book coming out, the 111 Magic, and you know, it's basically, if I may, and you can correct me. Yeah. It's only a guide to self-empowerment through magical practices, basically combining what? Spells, rituals, and meditation uh, yeah. that is ultimately designed to help individuals explore their spirituality, reclaim personal power, and foster self-growth. I just, uh, I'm just throwing that out there. Yes. Yes. That's, that's perfect. That's a great segue. That's great. Yes. Thank Everything you. in there and more. All right. Well, with that said, you know, every, every author's journey to writing a book, something specifically like that, has to have taken you on uh, exploration of self uh, to not only heal from something, but also to conquer and overpower, to be stronger and guide others. So with that, you know, you've written this book that's deeply personal and introspective, I, I would say, right? Would you agree or disagree with that, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I couldn't have written it if there wasn't, you know, some aspect of myself that had gone through this process. You know, so, well, with that though, uh, what what really what was first what was the first thing that really drew you to the world of magic and spirituality uh, for this process? Well, so that happened like way 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 back, like in the nineties. Um, I'm giving away a lot of my secrets right now, but in the nineties, before the internet and everything, um, I, a book fell into my hands. Um, a book called. To write a silver broomstick and it was um it, it was it was life-changing for me because until that point um i'd been raised in a christian home um <laughs> no like two different types of christian actually and like i love it like my brother's still christian get along you know like some like any other group some of them are great some of them aren't yeah, I, get um, it. I get it but it was never it was never my path. Um, I remember being in kindergarten and like asking where the Greek gods went. Like, where did they go? What, On vacation. They, <laughs> yeah. Like, are they hanging around? Can I go get them? So it, it was kind of always there, you know, and just like over the years, it um, became the only thing that, that felt real, you know, that felt tangible and true. So, um, yeah, that's that's kind of how I found that. It found me. It called me home. Yeah, you know, again, you know, as we grow up, you know, sometimes our faiths are placed upon us by parents before they get to know us. And, you know, like you said, you grew up in a Christian home. I, I, you know, I had a born again Christian mother, but I also had a Catholic father. My brother did uh, pay for the um, the ability to be an ordained minister of the uh, One Life Church. And he paid five extra dollars and became a wizard title, which is kind of funny, you know, and my other brother's a rabbi. So we discover ourselves as we get older. And yeah. You know, it's not uncommon for somebody to kind of push back against uh, the family norms while also maintaining good, strong, healthy relationships because our individuality is important as much as embracing other people's individualities, you know? Absolutely, yeah. And I mean, when you get down to it, all the religions are not that different anyway. Like, it, it, there's like some nuggets that you tend to see in all of them. Like, don't be a jerk. Yeah. You know, be all accountable for what son. you do. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That one's not in mine, but I mean, that could be interesting. Come down from Mount Sinai and smash the original Ten Commandments on the, uh, the bull because everyone was having sex with lambs. You know, 15. Uh, I mean, 10. 10. I mean, 10. <laughs> it's good to be the king. Yeah. Um, 
<laughs> now we're both giving away some uh, some secrets. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, reading through your book, I did notice a strong emphasis on themes like protection and empowerment. Mm -hmm. um, you know, are these themes that um, actively play a role in your own life and practices? Well, I mean, how could they not? I mean, especially with and empowerment. I know everybody uses that. It's like a cliche. It like this umbrella term for everything. Oh, you know, step outside and be empowered. Drink your coffee, be empowered. Um, you know, tap dance, be empowered. But like, <laughs> really knowing, um, if really knowing who I am, like, oh, and it's changed over the years. So, really knowing um how i've become empowered is <laughs> sorry you told me not to you told me not to worry about all the like flashes and i'm like oh this time <laughs> <laughs> so sorry about the break squirrels um <laughs> over there <laughs> but no like um doing things like moving to london right i had to believe that i could do it writing a book, I had to believe that I could do it. And not like in the, in the way where like, oh, I believe, you know, if I, if I starve myself, I'll, you know, be a supermodel by the end of the weekend, you know, like, like actual like empowerment though, is like, okay, what, what can I do? And you know, what's holding me back. So mm -hmm. it, it's a big theme in there. And that's, that's come a lot through my life. And, um, and protection's important because if, like, I, I don't care who you are. If you're struggling to survive, if you don't know where your meal is coming from, if there's not a roof over your head, you should not be worrying about empowering yourself right now. You should be worrying about getting some food in your belly, about getting a roof over your head, about being safe, about, you know, those are the things that should take priority. And then you can worry about empowerment. It'll be there. Yeah. You can come back to it. <laughs> Well, even your book, you know, uh, 111 Magic really talks about uh, there's nine sections to it. Ultimately, if anyone uh, would like to pick it up. But one of those are about protection and also but creating a safe space, you know. So I'm assuming it's not just uh, and again, we're just having a conversation about it. I'm not going to tell what's in the book, but uh, creating a safe space is not just about having a nice desk and it's clean and your house is good. But it's also about having a safe space with the people around you and feeling comfortable in your own skin and really accepting who you are. Would, would you agree with that? Absolutely, especially the accepting who you are bit because and I speak from personal experience because until I was like much older than I care to admit, mm -hmm. you know, I put on all these different masks that I thought were me. Like I, I went through phases in high school where I was like a cowgirl, then I was a goth kid, then I was a raver, yep. then I was, I, I, I don't know, like a hooligan, you know, like I had all these, all these things that I was like, oh, well that one wasn't me. So this one must be me. No, this one must be me. I like once all they got, all of them got stripped away. That's, you know, that's when I was like, oh, okay. So the stuff that's left, you know, when I get rid of all those masks, this good stuff that exists, that's me. Yeah. And it's not always, you know, easily put into categories. You know, some days, some days I'm still, you know, some days I'm still listening to Eminem's new album. Well, like the next day I'm listening to um, Ludovici and Ardi, you know, like, so it's, it, it's like all these things, you know, and not just trying to fit into one specific path. Yeah, but also, you know, going through those different identities uh, as a child also helps you find your truth when you're older. So those are like I was a cowgirl when I was in school and I had the best boots. <laughs> so, <laughs> you did. <laughs> rhinestones. Uh, always rhinestones, you know. Uh, I actually asked my mom when I was maybe like 12 or 13, I was like, Ma, I really want like biker boots, you know, because my brother had biker boots. And she's mm. like, no problem. And she comes home with these like snake skin leather cowboy boots with like the pointiest point and metal tip. And I was like, I don't think this is even close to what I thought it could be. And she's like, trust me, they're biker boots. I was like, if I had a horse. <laughs> I know they have horsepower, but mom, it's an engine. It's it's not the same. Um, I was uh, I was interested. Uh, 
you know, there's a section on healing and the emotional engagement, uh, which was particularly powerful. You know, like you're really you're really centering people on how to guide themselves to that that strength and that healing. Um, you know, just in general, not just for your readers, but what what is um what is something you want people to take away from you as an individual practicing these techniques of emotional engagement and healing, uh, you know, to inspire those around you in your circle? Like, what, what is it you want them to get out of this? That you have to put in the work? Um, that, that's a short answer. I also have a longer answer. So, um, sure. but the longer answer, so like a lot of times people, you know, when they hear my story, which we'll probably get to at some point in this podcast, but when they hear my story, they're like, Oh my God, you're so inspirational. I couldn't have done that. And you know, I'm like, I'm flattered. Thank you. It's very nice. But I, I really didn't do anything all that special. You know, I just kept going forward and I wasn't afraid to fail. I wasn't afraid to fall, you know, and I did fail and I did fall a lot of times. And, you know, I moved forward from that. So, and, and I think like, that's the only difference is I think people, they get, they get scared. They're like, oh, I, I know that this, you know, my life's not great right now, but at least I know what it is. So I'm going to stand there and, oh, and yeah. I'm going to keep this. And like, so I really want people to challenge themselves when you're scared. That's okay. Like be scared. Scared mm -hmm. is cool. Like, you know, not if you're being chased by some creepy bloke down the street, but like if you're, <laughs> if, if you're scared to change jobs, right? Like that's a good scared. If, if you're scared, um, like I mentioned, I live in England now. Um, I'm not from England. That's why I don't have the super cool accent that everybody does. But um, it was terrifying. It, it was so scary to sell everything I owned and, and travel and, and move across the country. And like, I just did it, you yeah. know, and, and that's what I want people to take away is like, just like, if you're scared, don't let that stop you from doing the things like you can, you can stay where you are and that's fine. And I won't judge you for it. And maybe you like it there. And, and that's awesome. Like, but you can't complain about things not getting better if mm -hmm. you don't do anything to change it. And that fear you're talking about is definitely something that will drive people to that complacentness, you know, where they're just like, well, I'm safe in the fear. I'm safe in what I know is the chaos. I, I know that when I come home, I'll be stressed. I know when I go to work, it'll be horrible. Like uh, what, what is the unknown of change? Like, I, I don't know if I can handle that stress. And what you're ultimately saying is if you can work on yourself first and you can find your safe place within, and you can find that self love that it'll help encourage you um, to take those steps, to take chances. And it, it's better to risk it all on change uh, than to live in the horror of nose, like self-inflicted nose. And, uh, it, you know, if I get that wrong from your book, obviously, please. <laughs> correct no, me. no, you're I'm like, wow, that's really profound. Did I write that? That's good. <laughs> um, no, and I think maybe like, because I, I spent a lot of my formative years in Nevada where like everything is gambling, you know, so you learn to take a little risk. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, you, you learn that it's okay to get, a little bit, you know, it's not okay to lose, you know, your house and everything you own. But, you know, if you want to spend, you know, $5 on, on the slot machines, okay, you might lose, you might hit it big, you might break even. It's a lot of outcomes. So, yeah, no, that's, um, that's definitely for my book. And you hit on something so important, like that, um, the sense of safety within yourself. Like, and I think we, we lose a lot of that because so many people I see are trying to be anything else, mm -hmm. any, anything else. And, and once again, I speak from a place of experience, like, but you're you and nothing you do is ever going to change that. You can change and bring out the best aspects of you, but you're going to mm -hmm. be you. You're going to be. So you can either learn to like it. You can either learn. Okay. And it, it happens in baby steps, you know, like, okay, maybe, maybe I do look better than I thought I looked in the mirror. Maybe, <laughs> maybe, oh, I did change my job. Okay. That was cool. That was a fun, you know, and, and it comes gradually, of course. but, um, but yeah, like the, those changes that, that we do, um, and it's all a process. It's all, 
Um, I think I mentioned in my book that this is not, you know, the end all be all book. And like once you're, if you do every meditation and spell and ritual, you are not done changing. Just, <laughs> just so you know, that was the warm up. I gave you the warm up. The first 111 acts, acts are warm ups. <laughs> yes. You know, and that, that's what's so beautiful is like if I suddenly like decide I, I don't like this aspect of myself, I can change it. I can work on that. I can become better. I can become more eloquent or funnier, or, although I'm already hilarious. But <laughs> I, can, <laughs> I can become, you know, anything I want to be, you know, from a, I, I mean that in a, in a spiritual, emotional kind of as like I'm, even like if I really manifest to... yourself into a unicorn, you know, though there are right. societies where that's acceptable. <laughs> <laughs> I, and I'm not, you know, even if I really want it, I'm probably not going to be an astronaut. I I get tired just watching people run, so it's probably not my life. It's probably yeah. not in the cards for me. But there are things personality wise, character wise. Um, that I absolutely can change about myself. I hear that uh, astronauts, though, um, have space to grow. Oh, uh, I see what you did there. <laughs> is that a dad joke? Do you have like a big It is. That's dad all joke? I have. I have no children, but I have plenty of dad jokes. Well, maybe yeah. you traded. So somewhere there's a guy with a bunch of children and he has no dad jokes. He has no sense of humor, you know, and uh, mm. sp speaking of, I, I thought I was losing my sense of humor and I went to the doctor. I was like, what's wrong? And he's like, oh, you're just ugly. And I was like, what? He's like, yeah, the prescription is just take away all the mirrors out of your house. You'll be fine. And it, it has worked. I have oh, good. I, <laughs> people still laugh at me. They say I'm very funny looking, you know, and uh, it worked out. So <laughs> practical, tangible change, real yeah. change for today. Yeah. Yes. I bought the secret. And it said, just believe in something. And uh, for, for years, I've been waiting for my paycheck to show up. But uh, apparently, you have to go to the job. Uh, so the, the secret lied to me somewhere. They said, all I do, I had this guy one. He was like, I bought the secret. It's the greatest book ever. There's this house I want. I'm just, I'm just going to think about that house. And then I'll get the house. I was like, are you, making, are you taking actions to get the house? And he's like, no, I don't have to. This book just says you have to sit there in the house and just meditate on the house. And I was like, I don't I don't know if that's how it works. <laughs> I think you need to do stuff, too. Like both. You have to. It's like, yeah, being a writer. you can't just be like, oh, I'm going to write a book. I'm going to write a book. I'm going to write a book. And like, you have time into it. Just like I'm going to heal myself. I'm going to. No, you got to you got to put work in. You know, it's it's very. It's very uh, uh, time consuming uh, for the better, you know. Um, yeah. I actually want to touch on something you said earlier, uh, just to kind of like uh, throw it back to writers. You know, with the fear, you know, uh, if we embrace the fear, sometimes it's difficult to make change, right? And with writers, uh, it's when you fear writing something specific, like you have an idea or a concept or a theme, but it's like, oh, I can't write that. I don't know if I could write that. Am I allowed to write this? And sometimes those end up becoming one of some of the greatest books because you're exploring a truly emotional truth uh, through this fear to really get that concept out. And, uh, you know, to, to throw back to your book, even, I, I think that's something that could happen with individuals, too, is if you challenge yourself to break through that fear, you might find the greatest story of your life is that new adventure, that new possibility, that new potential. Um, so I, I like that it's not just your, your, your technique is not just for healing, but you could apply it to even your skill sets, be it an authorship, or maybe you, you're a CEO of something, or maybe you're the, you want to be the greatest fisher person or whatever, you know? Yeah, <laughs> like I'm gonna I'm gonna watch this episode later and write some of these. Down. <laughs> I one time caught a fish this big, <laughs> this big. I sat on my boat and just I was like, I'm gonna catch. A fish. I was visualizing the fish. Yeah, be not, not. the fish. <laughs> be one with the fish. No, 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 no. <laughs> I am a mackerel. So, I, <laughs> be the ball. No, 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 no. <laughs> It's interesting you 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 mentioned that because in the in the first two books I write I talk a lot about like how you know you can you can do magic for a new job 
but if you don't send your CV in anywhere, like it's going to be useless. Like it, you will not get that job. I promise. Like, yeah. you know, it, you have to do the tangible steps and then like the magic can back you up and help make sure that you get the most effort out of what you put in. Yeah. Dungeons and Dragons, you know, like the, a priest can pray to the God, but all they do is imbue you with that extra energy to do something, but you still have to take action to get the bonus or magic, you know, like I have a magic thing, but I still have to do these things to make the magic palpable. You know, uh, I know that's a game and I know, I, I know it's fictional, but in the sense, that's the reality of it is like, it's just something, the magic that you're talking about, especially in this uh, 111 magic is ultimately you're enhancing something about yourself through effort, which means taking action. But mm -hmm. now you have that to take additional action towards the things you want to change or the things you're trying to accomplish. It's not just the spell or the magic itself manifests the results. They just right. imbue you with the ability to take, take action. Right, exactly. But wouldn't it be nice if it was like, I am a mackerel. <laughs> I, <laughs> I am a mackerel. Um, I, am a, I want to be I, Magneto because a lot of people would, I, I would change a lot of things. <laughs> <Let's just put laughs> that would be a cool superpower. I've thought a lot. And if I had superpowers, I'd be a villain. That's what I'm saying. You know, like, hands down. Right. Like who has the best, the best stuff, the, the villain. villain, the villain, yeah. Magneto. And I, I'd be a villain because like, I would just put a stop to stupid stuff. You know, where it's like, hey, don't hurt people and don't try to control people. Let them do whatever they want, as long as they are also not hurting people and trying to control people. And then if someone, like, starts trying to hurt people, dead. <laughs> <laughs> Done. You know, it's like I used to make this joke when I was younger. I was like, uh, I would tell people, I go, if I was like a, a, like a president or something, I would try to enforce a law where you get 50 years for getting caught drunk driving. Right. And then, like. This, the, when that law passed, everyone would be like, yeah, okay. And then the first person goes to jail for 50 years. They're like, maybe I can find a, a designated driver. <laughs> maybe I'll call an Uber. Uber? Yeah, is that, yeah that's a good app. I'm going to put that on my phone <laughs> right now. Home. <laughs> that's why I can't be in a position of power. I'm a... I'm a <laughs> <coughs> I, I think I'd be meeting with all the world leaders and like, every, like most, like 99% of the stuff I would do would be really good. And then I would just have like one thing in there that should like people are, really, why'd you do them? Mm -hmm. hey, why, why'd you do that? Why, why? Yeah, I was you bored. Oil. I don't know to save everybody. <laughs> um, you know, I, I do want to say, you know, there are some personal stories you have in the book, right? Cause they anecdotes, uh, you know, I'm curious if there were any specific spells or rituals from the book that have had a particular meaningful impact on you or others you've shared them with? Mm. There's so many in there. Um, I can share you like, I don't even remember what page it's on. Um, Cause you know, after you get it, they're like, move this over here and put this over here and change this and shift this around and over here. And over here. Move things. I get it. It, yeah. Yeah. So, um, but there is one, um, where there's a meditation and like, uh, I think it goes something like you, um, you meet a thief and you judge them. And then like, you found out that like their crime was stealing bread. Like, does it change how you viewed them? And then you see like a little old woman about to be hanged and, and you save her, but then you find out that she did something horrible. And like, it's, it's, it's one of the longer meditations in the book. Um, but I remember when I was writing that one just you know it took a really long time not because it's long but because there were so many parts um along that meditation where i had to stop and breathe a, a, and 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 take some time um because there were a lot of there were other ones in here that reminded me um of things that have happened in my past like the comfort being uncomfortable be, becoming comfortable with with discomfort mm -hmm. something like that um and that one, that's the one where, where I have people wrap themselves up, 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 up in a blanket because I think that's. Oh, yeah, yeah. Like when yeah. dogs with the lightning and thunder, it actually does help feel you feel a little safer because of compassion, yeah. compression yeah. And therapy, it's called or something. Yeah. And so in that in that one, um, you know, I actually did that while I wrote it. And like it was, it was freezing because England gets very cold in the winter and a lot of old buildings. And so I was wrapped in, in a blanket while I was doing that one. 
and I held it until it was uncomfortable. And then I held it a little longer because I wanted to experience what I was having people do. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of moments like that when I was writing these where I had to either sit a long time with them or where I wanted to try them out. Um, Anything with a personal anecdote, know that, you know, I didn't put that in there lightly. Um, That the personal anecdotes are, um, they're, (laughs) <laughs> I'm struggling for the word that was right in front of me. Yeah. So <laughs> they're innately personal. They're innately, they're deep down, like right, like in here, like down in the yeah. solar plexus region. Like you got to reach for them <laughs> and grab them and pull them out and put them in the book. What's yes. funny is we're writers and it's very difficult to find lots of words. So it's always like it was a big, big, huge, right. huge, massive, big. Giant thing. Giant, big, you know, house. <laughs> I, I joke with one of my best friends, you know, because, you know, sometimes I write some very beautiful, elo- eloquent passages. And then when I speak, I'm like, you know, the, the, <laughs> what am I looking? The, the, you know, the, and we, we always say words are hard, you know, but it, it's different speaking versus when you sit there and you're, you know, in the middle of a scene and you're writing it out and you're like, and the lightning is striking and they're walking yeah, yeah. through the door and they shut it behind them and they hear a sound and you're in this zone that's completely yeah, different. Yeah, yeah no, I. Uh... <laughs> the parakeet dies. <laughs> you said gas, I went cave. That's fine. That's fine. It could be a gas cave. I've seen it. It's minor. <laughs> Uh, not the children, but the actual people with picks. Uh, they deal with gas yeah, all the, the time. Miners. The, the miners. Yeah, the miners. The miners. Yeah, Snow, yeah, Snow White's friends. Yeah. <laughs> they work. They mine in the cave, right? They look at yeah. the gold and stuff. And other precious gemstones that are apparently very abundant in their cave. That's right. That's right. But they're poor because they're just cartoon characters, so they have no... Re- <laughs> <laughs> I wish you could sit in a cave and be like jewelry, <laughs> jewelry. <laughs> you know. Um, so now this this is a like you said this is not your first book. This is one mm-hmm. of a grouping of books. Mm-hmm. Um, in general, though, what got you into writing? But not necessarily like you know that old that age old questions like what made you become a writer? But I mean like specifically yeah. this genre like. Because, you know, there again, you, there are uh, colorful, purple, lyrical prose one could write. Uh, but at the same time, you are writing what we call nonfiction self-help, right? That's ultimately yeah. what it is. So, yeah. you know, what was the impetus to say, you know what, I want to focus my, my skill set on writing these books for now. I'm sure you probably have uh, foresight to be like, I'll use this as a jumping board to more fictional, but at the same time. Oh, I'll tell you about my fiction books later. Um, But so it was actually kind of an accident. And I know there's a lot of writers being like, they're like throwing stuff off. They're like, what do you mean? I've been querying for nine years. Um, But it was, it was kind of one of those serendipitous moments. So um, I spent my entire twenties being a screw up, made every bad decision you can make at least twice. Oh, so five Um, years ago. Yeah, five <laughs> years ago, um, when I was a zygote, and, <laughs> and so I made a lot of bad decisions. I found myself incarcerated. Um, when I was in there, one of the things you really you don't have much. You have books. That's yeah. what you get. Yeah, and and so and not and a lot of the ones that are donated are like. <laughs> so bad like i have not read so many trashy badly written romances since my time incarcerated but um when i was in there there were notebooks on on paganism that were mm-hmm. um that were for people who were incarcerated so like yeah. I, I i pulled books from you know cunningham and you know ravenwolf who i mentioned earlier and a, a few other great authors who were on those pages so fast forward um and i get out Yay! Um, and I start um, getting involved with with a pagan group. Um, I really like kept me. It gave me something constructive to do because you know I could have easily done a lot of those same bad choices again. But uh, gave me something to do. And then 
fast forward another few years and I ended up taking a, um, a year and a day style course for those okay. who don't know what that is. It's like, it, it's the basic lessons. It's, um, a, a magic that you learn over the course of a year and a day. Mm -hmm. And I took those into, into the women's prison mm -hmm. that I was at. Oh, like you um, went back? Yeah. I went back as a volunteer That's and awesome. uh, thank you. And, uh, it's, been one of the most rewarding experiences because let me tell you okay so some groups i'm not going to mention which ones but some groups want inmates to come to their program so badly that they will bring in pizza they'll bring in cake they'll bring in pie there's like balloons and streamers it's like a party right wait if and i get arrested i get pizza uh, it, 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 trust me, you don't want that pizza. <laughs> <laughs> it's not worth the price you pay to get pizza twice a year. We have um, streamers, but the pizza. No. <laughs> so there, there's some organizations who kind of, you know, for re reasons whether they're altruistic or not is a conversation for another day. But mm -hmm. they really want people to come to their events. And, um, and so I had women missing out on pizza, which is a huge deal in prison. Because prison food is bad. Yeah. It's really bad. So, but they would come to my group because they were getting spiritually fed. I like it. And so then COVID hit. Don't oh, yeah. It. I remember that. <laughs> I, 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 I think I, I remember it was a long. It was a weekend, right? Like it, was like, yeah, it was that one really, 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 really long weekend. Long, we all had. Your weekend. <laughs> <laughs> where none of us moved from our couch in that exact spot. But exactly. during that time, I couldn't go volunteer with these women anymore. And I was like, I really need, <clears throat> I, I really want a way to reach more people because I'm just one person. Yeah. And so the woman who I went um, into the prisons with, her name was Carrie. She has sadly passed on since then, but mm -hmm. she made an introduction and, um, you know, somebody with the Wellen loved my book, advocated for it. Um, I got my first publishing contract. I was like, oh, my God, they gave me a publishing contract. Holy cow, what do I do? And I had no idea. I had only thought a little bit about this book. You know, I, so I had to, like, come up with everything from scratch. So I started pulling out so notes. You were pitching it from scratch with, with just crumbs, uh, breadcrumbs yeah. of a concept. Can I, can I pause you for a second? So this yeah. is really great for the, for the audience to listen. You know, a lot of times uh, writers believe their book has to be so great. They can't, you know, be, be so good. They can't ignore you. Right. And I push back on this because it's not necessarily a true statement. Even mm -hmm. Martin, uh, um, Steve Martin, who basically phrase, uh, coined that phrase, uh, you know, he talks about it in his book and, all his opportunities came from what you just said. Somebody introduced you to somebody. Yes. And you didn't even have a complete quote unquote book that was so great. They can't ignore you, but you had the value of the relationship that introduced you the value mm -hmm. of those relationships. And then you proved your worth by being a presence present in the room itself. And then they were listening to you because they, they probably saw something in you that they were intrigued and therefore they were listening. Right. So yeah, for, for anyone listening to this show, when you're approaching your career as an author, it is not an individual game. You are not alone in this journey as a writer. You are a part of a community and a system. And that is why I believe deeply in network market practice. It's all about building, cultivating relationships that form a strong circle of influence, not an influ to influence your career, but to influence better habits. But you also have to market yourself. Who are you? What state, what kind of impressions do you leave on people, not just your audience, but the people that are part of your circle of influence? And ultimately practicing to learn your strength, to learn to increase your strengths and enhance your weaknesses. So when you are asked to join the tables, just like uh, um, you, uh, Ash D. Collins was, she was asked to join a table. So she was able to lead, follow, and advise how she was capable by using her strengths and weaknesses to better her opportunities in that pitch meeting. And again, just, uh, just one quick thing. You don't always get those one in a, one in a lifetime chances. You got right. an opportunity that is very difficult to get through a relationship, but you still came to the table prepared. You did not mm -hmm. shy away. Like you said, I didn't have an idea. I didn't have a book. 
but I knew I had crumbs and I knew my personality. And I, and I knew I was comfortable approaching this and I wasn't going to say, can I come back later? You right. embraced it. So I think that's beautiful and, and also a wonderful lesson for anyone who is listening to your story. Uh, hopefully it inspires you to not just rely on your book. Right. And I, I, and that's absolutely true because like when I, um, when I sat down, I had, I didn't even have a chapter, you know, like everything was like, I was like, well, I want to write a book for people who are pagans and they're incarcerated. And they were like, Oh my God, let's do it. Like, <laughs> I, and it, it, and it really helped that I have that lived experience aspect, you know, and, and then I, about I that. They knew about that. They Excellent. knew about the work I had been doing with incarcerated populations. Mm -hmm. They also knew it was not going to be a New York Times bestseller. They knew that because of the niche, that it, you know, I'm, I'm not going to tell you what my sales are, but, <laughs> um, you know, let's just say I have a long way to go to be Stephen King. Okay. That's but, fair. But that, that's it was a labor of love and that's why I did it. And still to this day, like um, I get letters occasionally from people who are like, you know, your book really helped me when I was in prison. And like, that's worth more than gold, yeah. you know, and that that's what keeps me going and keeps me writing books. And like, I, I did not know, like, I was like, when I sent the first draft, I was like, please don't let it be horrible. Please don't let it be horrible. Please don't let it be horrible. Please like it. <laughs> Please like it. And Beavish, I, I, Beavish. <laughs> Mackerel. manifest the bestseller. Manifest the bestseller. <laughs> and um and they liked it so much that they kept giving me contracts, you right. know. And and that's how I got third um three books. I've actually got contracts for two more books because apparently I'm crazy and I'm like, let's write two books instead yeah. of one. <laughs> Um, and a fiction book. So I'm very, I'm chained to my laptop all the time. You might um, even be able to write a book just with those letters. <laughs> maybe I might. <laughs> um, yeah. And so that's it. But what you said about networking, I've always thought that that's so important. Like don't expect anybody to go to their agent and be like, Oh my God, agent, you got to read this book. Right. But yeah. if, Somebody mm -hmm. knows you if you're like, hey, I know so and so, and I met you at um, at a business luncheon. You told me to send you my book. Here it is, and then you send them the guideline. They're ah, oh, they're more likely to read what you sent them because they're like, oh, I think I remember that person. Wasn't she wearing that great dress I liked? Okay, I'm gonna read this. Yep, see, that's all it is. It's you know, it, it, some people find the word network, market, and practice horrible words, you know, but really, if you look at network as who you know, marketing as who knows you, and practice is how well you know yourself, you're really going to approach those three horrible terms uh, <clears throat> in what they are. And it's about putting time into people, about leaving an impression on people, and only always working on yourself to, uh, you're investing in yourself to better suit those tables you join, because those tables you join aren't for you. You're there to build the mission of that table. And the publishing company that ultimately signed you believed not only in your mission, but that your mission suited their mission, that it was a part. That's why they're willing to take a chance on, as you said, not a guaranteed bestseller. And it, there was something about your mission to help others, especially in an incarcerated situation. Uh, and specifically pagans that don't necessarily have the reading material. And you were like, you know what? This is what I want to do. And they were like, you know what? That's worth investing in. That's worth building a relationship with, which is your brand. You know, that that is a part of your marketing is ultimately like, oh, you had this life. You had this journey. Obviously, your passion is there. We heard it while you were giving your speech. And, you know, and they were like, we're ready to invest in that brand. Yeah. And I, I think a lot of people forget, like, like it or not, publishing is a business. Yes. <laughs> it, 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 uh, sorry, I know I'm bursting some bubbles out there. What? You know, if they could run on like the love of reading, they would, <laughs> right? They, they absolutely would. Yeah. They're, they're not big evil corporations, but just you need money to market things. You need yeah. money to print books. It just is. You need money for your PR team. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, well, you were sitting there talking about like um, about like like the the branding and stuff like that. 
it occurs to me that even even the book I'm writing now, like the fiction book, has a lot of like a lot of the same themes about empowerment and breaking mm -hmm. cycles and mental health and wellness. And like I think once you um like some people end up writing very different books over the course of their career. Oh, but there's something to be said for, okay, let's see, I have a degree in this. How can I use this to write? Because my, I, I'll have a master's degree in writing soon, but my undergrad's not in writing. My undergrad has nothing to do with writing, mm -hmm. but I still use that in all the books I write. So it's this transference of skills and never, um, never downplay that, you know, it's, yeah, don't throw away a skill, you know, hey, oh, well, this has nothing to do with this skill. And you're like, eh, everything you learn, especially as a writer, is going to influence uh, how you approach your career and how you approach your writing. I mean, there was, there was this great quote uh, <clears throat> where it's like, you know, what, what, what is some great advice uh, for writing? And it's like, go live, live as much as possible, experience things because you, you, you need to know what it feels like to fail, what it feels like to succeed, what it feels to love, what it feels to lose you know, to have laws, you know, put that's your what phone down, me. put your phone down, put yeah. your phone down. I'm, I'm serious. Like go for a walk in the park and don't look at it through the screen. Like pay attention to what the grass feels like when you step on it, you know, like what kind of birds are there? Like super random fact. There's par there's parakeets in London that yeah. are just like, they've taken over the place. Like they're everywhere. You know, like, <laughs> you wouldn't know that unless you came to visit and you're like, oh, look, are those parakeets? Why are there parakeets? That's weird. Yeah. Like, you know, you can't yeah, your phone's a good resource, a good resource for if you need to know, like, OK, if my character is on a jet, how how long should it take to get from point A yeah. to point B? Stuff like how that's long fine. Take for pizza to be delivered. Right. But um, if, if you're not experiencing the world with your with your senses without a, a phone, you're missing out on so much you could be describing. And that's especially a little secret. Listening to people's conversations has <laughs> been, I, some people are like, oh, isn't that eavesdropping? But like, I, I find one of the biggest challenges people have in dialogue is they write what they think the dialogue should say instead of what the dialogue would actually say mm -hmm. in any real situation. And I use the example of ordering coffee, like, bad dialogue, which is what most people think it sounds like. Hello there, sir. Hello, ma'am. Would you like a coffee? Yes, I would love a coffee. Like, that's not how we sound. We go, yeah, good morning. Uh, latte, please. Bed day. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and it's much more realistic that way. And so it's important to pay attention to like what people are saying and how they're saying it and how it changes the context of their conversations. Yeah, I love listening to people talk. It's just when they open up the closet and find me. That's where it gets like a little uncomfortable, you know, but like it's so warm. <laughs> you don't have one of those fancy invisibility cloaks? I thought I did, but they I was sold. I was sold snake oil. <laughs> <laughs> the emperor has new clothes. <laughs> Do you like them? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, no, I agree with the dialogue thing. Uh, you know, as someone who writes, uh, I started in um, in scripts and screenplays and, and stuff like that in, in the industry, as one might say. Uh, you know, and now I write fantasy and stuff. And sometimes uh, people, uh, when I'm doing developmental editing for people, like I'll read their dialogue. I'm like, you're you're telling the ideas through the words and not necessarily through their emotions and. In reality, people don't talk directly to one another unless, of course, you know, maybe you're educating somebody or you're, you're having a very specific, uh, you know, dialogue that is a debate, more a debate than, uh, than anything. And it's it's I, I always I always my one of my is always less dialogue. If you're saying too much, if you're saying too specific or, or, or using too too much of a, a specific kind of dialogue, cut back, say less, say less, do more. And, and that usually helps them find the voice of the characters. But a lot, but a lot of times they think, well, I, people won't understand. It's like, look, you have to write for a dumb. You have to write. You have to write for a dumb audience, but don't dumb it down, right? So uh, have faith that they will be able to see subtext. Have faith that they'll be able to see emotion. You know, 
uh, w- one of the things I, I I'm really grateful for is that the high feedback I get is you write cinematically, you okay. write through the Ooh. characters, and you can feel the camera move, right? So fun. <laughs> it isn't until you're fighting the pigs. Uh, <laughs> Like low in angle, rise up, scene sweep. Well, yeah. Well, when you're writing fiction, you know, I I talked about this. I think another time on an, on an episode It's like we we don't as writers we don't always think of camera, but in reality, if somebody is talking to someone else, that's usually a two shot. If somebody is having inter you know, thinking inward and they're they're really going through these these concepts uh, and and like moving through the emotion and processing information, that's like a single close up. But then like if you look at a scene like let me set the scene, that's an establishing master shot. Let me get a little closer. Let me show the movement. Let me do uh, inserts. Let me like if you think of the camera, you and then if you move those shots people that are just listening can't see my hands but i move, <laughs> you move the shots he's widening in, his hands for the people listening i'm i'm shrinking and widening shrinking and widening <laughs> but think of the way you move dialogue and character movement not just their physical movement but the movement of their emotions think of how you describe the environment around them because sometimes people just write a really strong intro to a scene and then it becomes dialogue heavy and they don't always realize that the table still exists. The, the, if they're in a tavern, the, the patrons are still making noise and talking, which could interrupt. And if you just slip in that, you know, uh, they leaned in to quiet their discussion, uh, you know, uh, over the, the, you know, the, the rowdy crowd clinking their cups in the background, just kind of because that brings you out of the shot a little bit to kind of see the scene. And then you come back into what they're saying quietly. And it's, it's things like that, that move the camera in and out on the page, allowing the audience to have what we said earlier, pattern interrupts. You're you're creating an interrupt to the stagnant, like just back and forth dialogue. Anyway. I I really love, I hadn't considered it like that because my background isn't, is it uh, as he picks up his cup? He's like, boom, mic drop. <laughs> the characters made me do it. <laughs> no, I, I love that description. Um, I'm doing a lot of that with the, um, the the fiction piece I'm working on for my. When you get a, an MFA in creative writing, like you basically mm-hmm. submit a book oh, nice. at the end. Like, so for the, the book that I've been working on and pouring my heart and soul into for two years. Is it historical you know, fiction? Uh, not in the context that most people consider historical fiction, um, unless you consider like the eighties, nineties and two thousands to be historical. historical. Because but, <laughs> that's it. I don't know how I was, I lived through those eras. <laughs> I, I don't consider that historical fiction. Yeah. I what do you mean? Like, it's classic. <laughs> now. Like, no, I was there. I remember. Um, but no, my, my piece now is about like, um, uh viviana collier she's the main character and she testified against her father when she was 12 years old and so it follows these multiple timelines like robert and hers and you know follows that transformation how he went from like a boy in the 60s to who he became and how that moment changed her life and who she became and that's currently when i'm 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 shopping that to agents right now just saying listeners (laughs) <laughs> listeners if any of you are agents and want a brilliant book um i don't know good I mean, <laughs> whether it's brilliant or not i will let other people decide but i'm i'm quite proud of it and um some of the dialogue in there like i i like to think of it as like i just drop in snippets mm-hmm. you know just like uh, and three lines of dialogue and scene you know, that's how I like to do it because those three lines of dialogue can like really show so much emotion, just like whether your character is happy to see somebody or not happy to see somebody or like answers them in grunts. Like all those mean different grunts things. They're always good. Yeah. Mm. yeah. But also uh, the illusion of dialogue as well. So like, you know, if, if, if I said to you, uh, no, if you, if you as a character was like, uh, you know, are you hungry? And then I'm like, well, I can go out. Like that is ultimately saying, yeah, I'm hungry. I can get something to eat, mm-hmm. but you're not actually saying it. You're saying, yeah, I could go out. 
and and that's the reality of dialogue is again we don't always so it's the illusion of dialogue meaning like it, it's saying one thing but it really means another and uh not everyone can catch that especially when there's no physical emotion being represented on a screen per se because it's on a book but uh you know that's where uh, dialogue tags and and and, and action beats and, <laughs> you know. well, and and then you can shortcut dialogue too because i think a lot of people try to put like every single thing that would be said when uh, you could just say like they continued their conversation and decided to go out for burgers you you could do that uh the, the rule of thumb though is uh if it narratively influences the movement of the story then it must be represented and presented. If it doesn't, then you can shorthand it, like you're saying. So if it doesn't influence, then you don't need to live in the moment, which is basically what you're saying. Like, uh, you know, they grabbed their bags and left. But yeah. in reality, you actually take that out. That is the first thing you cut. So they say start in the middle and and end at the excitement, right? So what does that even mean? So you could be like, all right, you know, they drive into the driveway and they grab their bag and leave. Well, they the open the door, they, they the sit door, down, they, they sit down, and it, you know, their girlfriend or boyfriend walks in and they're like, hey, babe. Like, it should start with maybe not even hey, babe. It should start with whatever that scene is about. It should start with her sitting down on his lap, like, Mwah. hey, babe. It could, it could, you know, but is that what the scene is about? Is it about it's, that kiss? It's what my scene's about. Or, <laughs> it's <laughs> erotica. <laughs> they held, they held their, never mind. Um, oh, wow, wow, wow. This is a family show? It is not family friendly. <laughs> okay. but it, is, it is, it is friendly. Uh, <laughs> but, um, you know, uh, a lot of times, a lot of times the strength of a scene is really the emotional truth of it. And, you know, uh, you know, if two characters are there to, let's say, move the plot along, but we also want to see some character development, uh, well, what is the plot you're trying to move along? So they're in the house. Uh, what's the purpose of it? Um, oh, you forgot about the, the wedding that's coming up and we have to get ready for it. So really, that's where you would start it. You would start it sort of with the introduction to that. Like she walks in, jumps on her lap and goes... Did you get the present that I told you to get for the wedding? And now we're in the middle of the scene, but that's where it's starting. So instead of jumping on a lap, kissing you, hey, baby, how was your day? Blah, 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 it yeah. starts with the truth, which is, did you get it? But it also creates instant tension and instant right. conflict because he didn't get the because present. He didn't get the present. He, he didn't he get did. the present, no. Of course he didn't get the present. He brought the beer home, but he did not get the present, you know? And uh, uh, but, <laughs> but now that now you get to explore that. And, like, do they work through it? Does she forgive him? Does she not forgive him? Does she end up Is going it the to last the last straw? Does she go to the wedding by herself? Does, Does she key his yeah. car on the way out? Like, we don't. We, we don't know. But we, we don't know. Explore that. And, uh, but, you know, uh, I've read books uh, from clients where, that scene would end where it's like, well, we have to go get the present, get your jacket on. We're going to leave and go, we got to get it now. And then like it continues on and mm. they're getting their jackets and they're getting their keys and yeah, they're getting yeah, back yeah. into the car. But all you got to do is stop it literally at we're going now, get your stuff. Let's go. End the scene. And Cause everybody that knows what's coming next. Everybody knows Yes, that the scene is going to continue with them getting their jackets and their keys and getting in the car and driving to the store and going and getting the presents because yes. we know how human nature is. Correct, and yeah. th that that is stronger writing when you can infer where it's going because, like you said, mm -hmm. human nature can take over. There's certain things we can, you Not know. Yeah, that's why you don't have to get super descriptive with movement, also, unless that movement again is narratively essential to the story and when i say story because again you know for anyone who listens to the show or they follow my channel on writing uh nar a narrative is made up of story and plot plot is what needs to happen and story is how it unfolds so a lot of times you should be focusing on the story because that's the movement that's how we're we're seeing characters live and how their emotions are forming whereas plot is we have to learn that uh, he didn't get the present and that also there's a wedding coming up in, in a week. Like that's technically the plot. And maybe it, they go out and get the stuff. It, yeah. It's more the, 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 the factual, steadfast, A, B, C, D. Yes. More yeah. the bump, 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 bump. 
or like beating out your chapter where it's like, you know, he <clears throat> he's on the couch. She sits on his lap uh, as she's going to ask about the present. He did not get the present. Uh, they have a discussion about how to handle the present. Uh, and they they uh, they have two different positions. His is, well, I could just go get it tomorrow after work. And his is the sooner we get it, the better it'll be. So now those are the two positions that you're arguing and then who wins and who doesn't win, whose position changes. Completely. Oh, you Stop. never get the present. You never get the I, present. I'm just going to, you're going to forget it again. I'm just going to go now. <laughs> go now. And also, could you pick me up some pizza? Uh, <laughs> you know, so th that is like how you would beat out the, because like you would ask questions to yourself, like, you know, that you would write, what is their position? What is their concern? And that's not really story, but it is important to create the story, you know? I, I also tend to find that like if I'm if I'm having to force something too much when I'm writing, that's probably not the direction it's supposed to take. Yeah, like if I'm just, hemorrhoids. Yeah, like if I'm sitting there and I'm like, and she enters, and, uh, and I'll just scrap like paragraphs. Oh yeah. Like to the last point where it feels like story, and then I'm like, okay. Let's do you do something. do you do like zero drafting, uh, zero discover drafting, or do you just kind of like attack the first draft and see where it goes? I kind of um, I'm not familiar with that first term. So uh, how oh. I do is um, I I'll be writing and I'm going through, and then I'll read a little bit, and then I'm like, okay, that'll work for now, and I keep going, or I'm like, oh. That doesn't work. Let me Google 75 things to write this one sentence and I'll be right back. Right. And then I'll go down a rabbit hole for about an hour and then I'll come back and I'll write that sentence. I'll be like, that was a really good sentence. It's very satisfying. Yeah. Then I go take a nap and then, <laughs> <laughs> and then, um, you know, I'll write a little bit more and, but I tend to think of it as like, um, like, like downloading is what I call it. Okay. Yeah. And like when you're when you're in in the mode where just like like you're writing and then when you're done you don't really remember what you wrote. Yeah, train of thought. Yeah, and you just like and you, and you follow it. But I tend to um, I do a lot of edits, but I tend to like edit as I go, oh, yeah. and then like because I find I tend to I don't want to have to go back through and like do a lot to my whole story. So I just kind of want it to be very good the first time through, <laughs> but. Like good enough. Good enough I know for a line editor. It, yeah, like sometimes I think people go through and they're like, "Oh, should I use the or the?" And you know, it does <laughs> not make a damn bit of difference yeah. if the fruit she's holding is an apple or an orange right now. It does not just write something down and keep going. Yeah, they I, and, you put in brackets and you come back to it later. Yeah, and I I do a lot of highlighting. If I'm like, okay, something, 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 I'll just highlight that. And then I'm like, okay. And then I'll, I'll write the next bit and figure out how they connect later. Yeah, so, yeah. yeah, there's a lot of just, you know, just get it done. Just Yeah, there's so many different ways to approach it, you know, and whatever ends up working for the person as an author or writer is always going to be the best way. And mm -hmm. But again, you know, it always changes. And especially the way you write fiction versus you write nonfiction. You know, I, I have both genres written, but you don't approach them the same way. They can't. Yeah. One is narratively based and one is you know, like, here are things you can do. <laughs> yeah, my nonfiction work is like so many sticky notes. And then like, I have, I have, I use a writing, a writing program um, now that I discovered it. Scribner? I use Scribner. Scribner. Yeah. I use Scribner now. And um, so I'll just put like little notes. I'll be like, um, you know, in writing this one, I'm like self exploration spell. Bullet point, bullet point, bullet point, bullet point. And and then like, okay, next thing, bullet point, bullet point, link to a video I watched, mm -hmm. you know, and it's messy. My yeah, writing yeah. style is so messy. First draft. Yeah, it doesn't yeah. it doesn't matter. I'm gonna move that stuff around later. Hey, you don't have hyperlinks in the book? No. <laughs> Magic. <laughs> I mean, that could be cool if they were like done in the right way. <laughs> like you open a fiction book and there's a hyperlink and it takes you to a video of a scene from a movie oh, that inspired that author to write that bit that they didn't plagiarize. Don't plagiarize. No plagiarize. <laughs> don't plagiarize. Yeah. I don't know. It could be, it could be focused. Isn't everybody always the next big thing in writing? 
Like, <laughs> what is the next? What is the, next? the current thing you're writing? That's yeah. <laughs> like, can we just get really good with words again? Can we do that? My, my least favorite statement from writers is, this is my best book. And you're like, well, what happened with the other ones? Mm. <laughs> Did they turn into crappy books? You know, I get better every new book. Well, then I'll wait to your like 30th book then. Let's, let's I, wait I mean, done. I, I do think I get, I learn more. I can apply yeah. more skills with every book. But like, I, I think my first one is always like, it's always going to have a, a special place because it launched my career. Yeah. You know, and, and it is a book. Books are hard to write. So to have a book, even if it's bad, is great. Uh, and there are some very bad published books that I'm not going to mention. But great. I I have read a couple that I was like, <laughs> how? Like, it renewed my faith. I was like, oh, my book can get published. Like, oh, I could do this. I could totally <laughs> do this. And then, you read, and then you read some books like... Um, like Julia Armfield, like every time I read her books, I'm like, God, I wish I wrote like her. She's incredible. Mm -hmm. She's so amazing. She used lyrical style writing. Yeah, it's it's like reading poetry in prose form. It's oh yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's the way you gotta go for it. I, I like to mix that and, and realism. So you get you get that, but I my violence is very descriptive in my books, but like the emotional stuff is very lyrical in my book. Mm -hmm. You know, but I also have a bard character somewhere in the book, so he's always <laughs> like pontificating with like ridiculous <laughs> choices of words. He using like the longest words he can find and rhyming them with orange. Because yeah, not. and people and people always like, what, will you just shut up with like, what are you trying to say? <laughs> That's what they do. <laughs> just well, say. There, there's space for both though, because you know, on one hand, we have Tolkien, who you know spent 173 pages describing the bark of a tree. And then, you know, we have, <laughs> and then we, we have other writers who are very good storytellers and they, you know, don't use as much of the lyrical flowy language, but like you get into their books and you can sink your teeth into them and they're, they're both great writers. It's yeah. It's, it's all about movement and flow. And, you know, uh, a lot of times pace can be affected by, uh, you know, actually what's funny is some people forget that pace is just the speed at which information is presented to the reader. And they think more is slow pace. In reality, more is not slow paced. It's <laughs> thickness is slow pace. Uh, thinness. Uh, and what does that even mean? Like if you have a passage that is a half a page long, that's thick. So that slows down the pace. If you're spending too much time on something and you're not uh, adding new information to it, that is thick. It becomes, you know, it's a. Uh, it's dense, so that slows the pace down. Uh, it's all that delicate balance that takes that you just like you keep learning it. You yeah, know? you do need to slow things down, but there is a difference between slowing something to become emotion to breathe emotionally mm -hmm. through the filtered experience of the character, which is again the close up of the camera that we were talking about, and then there's that which is good slow pace, but then there's Let's stop the story and explain the historical elements of this branch uh, for the last 500 generations of that tree. Like, but we're in the middle of, say, a battle, right? Right. Timing. So, yeah, there is, there is, you know. <laughs> that, that 500, that last 500 years of the history of the branch, you put that someplace else in the book, it might work. It could, but the bet the better choice would be seeding. You know, you would take the chunk of that and say, "What are the true elements?" and then just seed little bits of that throughout the narrative, mm. uh, through uh, through again filtered through the emotional experiences of the characters, like the like maybe they're involved in something, and those piecemeals actually become something the reader will absorb better, because chunks become forgettable, whereas slow learning becomes rememberable. And that's why they say, show your characters traits. Don't tell your characters traits. So if their leadership qualities don't are shown. say I'm a leader. Yeah, yeah, I'm a leader. He is a leader. You know that guy is a leader. Like that, <laughs> that becomes terrible. <laughs> but even if you take a page or a chapter dedicated to they are a leader, that's be that, that doesn't help infer that they are a leader. But if you show one small moment here where they're showing a leadership quality or they show another, or they take charge here or they inspire or they, right. That it's journey. Letting the reader do some work. Yes. And that, that becomes, 
So seeding is a little bit stronger than chunking. But again, you do want to slow down the pace by going into the experience, of course, but not to explain. If you explain, that is that is dense chunking, and, and that would be bad pacing. Well, it also kind of, like, have you ever read Perfume? Uh, no, I but I've smelt it. <laughs> so it's a good perfume, right? And what I love about this book is in most books you get, you know, it looked like this, and then it looked like this, and this is the color it was, and this is how tall it was. And, like, this is all described through smell. Oh, and it's yeah. it's fantastically done, but, like, there's there's bits in there. And even though, like, I'm like, why is this bit in there? Like, without that bit, I, I think the story would lose it. Like, there's a spot in the middle where he goes to live in the woods. He mm -hmm. goes so far away he can't smell any people because he's got like this amazing sense of smell and he's like in there living off moss and it's just <laughs> it's so slow even though there's like it, it, you know it's just like and he licked the moss and that's how he lived and he did that for months and it's just very true la 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 but i think even though that part of the book it's a little difficult to get through. I, I think without it, um, yeah, it, it loses something of the before and after. It's like a transition in that case. Yeah, that, that might not be pacing. That just might be that it's slow. Like it's just a drawn out scene. But pa pacing again is just the amount of information, the speed at which information is presented to the reader. Not necessarily like a scene. Like if he lived in the forest for like three chapters, that's not necessarily a pacing issue. <laughs> More or less, like, can we get out of the forest? Uh, but also, if he's experiencing immersion, like, like you're saying, he's smelling and he's learning these perfumes, and uh, you know that that becomes exciting. But again, you know, you could have a three sentence pro, a one sentence pro, uh, uh, you know, a five a sentence 57. pro, a fifty set, right? And now, now you're changing up the pace by creating that is the movement of information, the speed at which information is being presented to the audience. There should be some mathematical formula for that. You know how we have like E equals MC squared. We need something literary. That's like pace equals time. There is a formula. There's absolutely a formula. Yeah. You what's the to, formula? You think of the camera. So if it, if it is the further the camera is away from you, the, the faster the moment is. The closer you get to the person or the closer the camera gets, the slower, the, the, the more information you want to create because it has to be emotional truth. But it can't, it, the furthest you can get back, by the way, is exposition. So if you just jump back and you go seven years prior, four skulls and three and three, three fortnights, uh, the wagon wheels. Like now we don't know where the camera is. It's just narration, right? But, there is no camera. The cameramen are on break. They're having. Yeah, they coffee. took a break. You know, Patrick Stewart's explaining X Men. You know, they're they're, they're in a union. They yeah. can't work right now. It's they can't work right now. So yeah. so the formula is to just think to constantly move your camera in and out. If you can move your camera to a close up, to a mid, to to an establishing master shot, to maybe a close up, to a master, to a mid. Maybe you could switch. You know, switch to over the shoulder. Maybe you could do a, a, an insert like the insert would be like contextual exposition. So where are they? They're in a tavern. Right. So if, if you explain like something about the tavern, you know, the 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 one I bore on the wall stared at him as he contemplated his next move, almost as if being judgmentally persuade into taking action. Right. That is technically exposition. Uh, and telling, but it doesn't slow down the pace because it is still necessary to the emotional movement of the narrative. But if you went into the history of that boar. <laughs> and, and a lot of it also like depends on the genre too, because you might not go into the, the boar staring at him, like, you know, challenging him to move into action. Like that would fit in a fantasy story, but it might not fit as well in like crime fiction. For example, in crime or... fiction, yeah. So in crime fiction, uh, the same example might be examining a, a room that is a crime scene. And now we know that we have to spend time on the details. 
but it's through the filtered experience of the characters. So what are they perceiving since usually they're written in first person anyway, because mm -hmm. thriller, right? And also you want to be inside their head. You need when it's when it's a detective kind of story, you want to be in their head so you can see their process. That's what made Jack Reacher such a great book series is because we're hearing his process, even though he's a quiet character. And that's why in the movies and the TV show, he talks more because one of his great qualities is the way he processes information. So we have to hear it because it's a different medium. Um, but in that situation, you would slow down the pace to explore the information or data that they are perceiving through their the way they process it. But it would be sped up. The, the pacing would be sped up, you know, when they're having a conversation with people. Yeah. You know, which you have to mix that in. So let's say they're at a crime scene. There should be another person there to play off of. Or maybe there are cops, uh, you know, blood spatter experts working their stuff and the detectives coming in, who's the main character. And she's like looking around. And then there's there's an there's an officer as there would be to, you know, keep the door. So you, you start creating characters and movement and you could break up the slowed pace of exploration with interaction with the police officer and also the blood expert. So, and, and that's how you would kind of help that scene move along a little bit. I think it's interesting when you put all this in the context of like different genres and expectations and like what readers want and like, cause you can get away with some things in, in certain genres that you can't in other genres. You know, oh, yeah, yeah, like a romance. You have to have a happy ending. Like, you, you have to. to. Yeah. And, and there has to be that tension, like where they meet and at first they don't like each other or they do like each other, but they don't think that the other one likes them. And it's a whole thing. Yeah. And it's. Yeah. The but it, yeah, yeah. But, you know, in, I don't know, like a horror story that takes on a completely different context where they meet and at first they don't like each other and then they yeah. like each other. Yeah. It just becomes a little. They sleep here. together and then they die because that's they, the yeah story. yeah and they they and wake they up. And... <laughs> but but even in those genres, the the rules of good writing still apply. But true, the, the things you need in genres that doesn't necessarily change how pacing works or change like, for example, there's always going to be an ordinary world. Like if there is no ordinary world in the in any form of narrative writing where it sets up the motivations, who the characters are, the rules of the world, uh, you know, maybe the potential for the antagonistic force. I say force because it doesn't have to be a person. It could be internal. It could be external. It could be the, the weather, you know, like, uh, you know, the, on the edge of tomorrow, you know, where they're fighting the cold, you know, it's going to be a cold, you know, Jake Gyllenhaal movie. But also you need an inciting incident. Like, no matter what genre, right? You need something that challenges Happens. the ordinary world to force them to take action, uh, to go into, you know, the second act. Eventually there also has to be twists or pinches. It could be either one, right? So there are certain rhythms to a narrative where there is a twist or a pinch in that moment. Uh, you know, and one is emotional and one is physical. So depending on, I, I wonder in a book, like, like, have you ever read Chocolat's? Uh, yes. That's yeah, I went, it is a movie. There's a lot that are. Isn't um, Depp in it? Johnny Depp in it. Johnny Depp wasn't. It was like forever ago. It came yeah. out in the. Um, mm. I, I recently read the book and just think about that. Like, I guess there is the one twist, like later on when the gypsy camp burns down. Well, that would be a pinch because it's physical. Oh, okay. So a something changes physically in the world or the environment or the person, that's a pinch. If it's okay. an emotional reaction. It, oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I apologize for that. The pinch is emotional because it's a pinch. The twist is a physical. I, I apologize for that. Okay. You are correct. Okay. Yeah. So I'm trying to think because now I'm going to be looking for examples where there's not a twist. Or there's not because there are some books that are just very and especially when you start looking into um like other cultural books like the epic chinese novel where like things just it's it's just oh, it's another just like day. Mundane day yeah it's just like like there's 92 chapters where it's a monday a mundane day but like there's a lesson if you read like carefully enough I, i'm very interested with challenging expectations of genre you know
Yeah, but uh, again, you know, that wouldn't I, necessarily take away from the fluidness of a narrative, you know. It, and by the way, a twist doesn't have to be dun dun dun. Like it doesn't have to be that. It could just be something as simple as, you know, they learn that uh, they had a long lost brother and they're challenging the will of their father. Like that's not necessarily dun dun dun. It's just it's putting an obstacle in their way that changes the way they approach whatever case. Because in the first act, you need at least a twist or a pinch at a certain point, which directs them into taking movement to solve the problem which puts them into the new world of the second act and mm -hmm. then of course you need the midpoint conflict in a story which reveals the truth of the lie whatever they believed going into that midpoint conflict there is something that presents a truth that they did not believe and now they either completely change somewhat change or they double down by not changing at all that's my favorite oh where they double down yeah yeah where they double down and they're just like mm -mm. they're like no yeah no. But that, that becomes interesting because now they have to find a solution no matter how they approach it to the midpoint conflict, uh, which then when they once they do find that solution, they realize in the third act that it might not be the solution they thought was going to work, which then escalates the conflict and tension. Uh, and then and they, they have fail. To, they can fail. Uh, yeah. Usually in a story, when they fail, there's usually a moral uh, a growth. They grow morally or the reader grows morally. So there's a moral truth to it. Um, if there's a sequel <laughs> or it's setting something up, they can fail. And uh, But usually there is a resolution uh, to the ultimate, you know, like, oh, I, I figured it out, you know. Um, but you... You need those things, but how you approach that becomes the story that you're telling. And that's what makes writing, because there's only like, I think there's uh, seven seven stories you could tell. I, I, I have that book on my shelf where it has like the, the seven. That's it. There's, there's yeah. only seven. But the the way, but there are there are there are at least one million books out there, you know. What I'm saying? Yeah, they're all different. Yeah, and they're all different because it's through our perspective, it's through our emotional truth, it's through how we choose words, it's how we use chapters, it's how we use chapter breaks, it's how we, you know, like um, sometimes in my books I'll use onomatopoeias, you know, like I'll add that bang, you know, like, but it creates a rhythm in the flow of the story of dealing with something right um sometimes I'm a fan of alliterations myself you're you like the alliterations uh, yeah that's why my first book are paganism for prisoners paganism on parole pa like you know i just i i could love a good alliteration especially with a la do you like when it's an alphabetical order where it's like a b can dig everyone <laughs> no, four. no, no, but I like when there's like when a sentence sounds like the wave of an ocean where it's like, whoosh. oh, yeah, 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 you could do that, I, yeah, it's, it's a play of syllables, you get to do that with a play of syllables, mm -hmm. you know, you gotta put your hand here and talk though, you know, so you can feel the syllable <laughs> in school again. I want to, okay, uh, uh, or the comes in and you start using like, really short, snappy sentences because <laughs> it's crazy, on, yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. Which is also important in fictional writing is you want to change up the and, and create variety in your sentence lengths. You know, some I the first sentence to Game of Thrones, I think, is like three lines long, but it's one sentence, you know, you know, because it talks about like it's the seventh win, uh, seventh year of the summer or whatever. But like you can do that. But if it's always like super long sentences that that becomes slowing the pace because the information, the speed at which the information is being presented is going in these long drawn out movements. So within a passage, you can break it up with what you're saying, where it's like, you know, they, she sat down on the chair, she turned around, she was listening to what was happening in the back of her mind. She heard and a crash. She heard a crash, you know, whatever. Uh, or, or a crash took her away from her worries. She stood up and ran to the window, unable to open it as the door behind her smashed open. Oh and my God, I'm scared. <laughs> you know like there you go that's 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 move that's only one passage though yeah you know so uh yeah i'm sorry i, I love the i love writing and i love the uh i could talk no, about I, writing. i sorry. i love this too because like you know we are very solitary creatures and you know so i don't get to talk I, you know most people when i start talking about writing they're like i like your book i read it and like that's that's the feedback i get that's 
thank you for the support. That's amazing. Um, but like, you know, I want somebody who can be like, actually right here, I think we pull out of the character's point of view a little bit and here's why, and here's why I don't think, it, you know, and like, uh, so it's, it's good to have these conversations and I've learned, I'm going to use that movie, the movie oh, set excellent. thing. I, I'm, yeah, I'm going to, yes. Gonna, craft yeah. talk. I love craft, not the cheese, but, uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, that's not cheese. No, it's not. It's processed. It, <laughs> it doesn't. I think that's the one that doesn't even say cheese on the label. I think it it says like American pasteurized. It's made with <laughs> made with milk. <laughs> milk from a from a goat or a lizard, whatever we can get. Sometimes a goat lizard. <laughs> I want to write a story about a goat lizard who feels abandoned by society. Because they won't milk him? Yeah, they're like, all I want to do is be milked. You know, I make him Italian like me, and like he's Sicilian. Hey, I just don't want to be milked. Eh? <laughs> I'm so full with the milk. Won't somebody relieve my pain? <laughs> my pain, it's a building up in my tetas. Por favor, eh? Palo Italiano. Oh, good times, good times. Good times, good times. How did we get here? So anyway, 111 Magic. <laughs> oh, oh, yeah, hey, uh I forgot we were still on the show for a while. I'm like, what? that's my favorite thing. That's why, like I said, I like the show to go about an hour, but you know, when it goes into casual conversation, that's my favorite. You know, I yeah, feel like, with this. no script, no. And then I wrote a book and it was a good book. And the book was published and people <laughs> should read my book. Click the link. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, people should read my book. <laughs> it's, it's, it's a good book. I enjoyed the read myself. <laughs> Nice. That's what you said everyone says, right? I, I, I'm going to put that on there. <laughs> it's like a Thomas, good book. I enjoyed uh, Thomas it. enjoyed it. He enjoyed <laughs> all it. The time. Yeah, the, uh, the, the, uh, the, what did it call that uh, on the book cover when they take like a quote? But like, there's a word for it, but uh, it's funny. Um, all right. Well, you know, it, it's been almost an hour and a half. And, uh, you know, obviously we're both very busy. I know you're busy because you are you just turned 27. So you got a whole life ahead I of you. Yeah. Yes. 27 and a half or something. That's right. I pay attention to the birth dates. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so uh, how can people find you if they want to explore your life and see uh, what you have going on? And remember, uh, this is both video and audio. So uh, if there's any spelling involved, I would recommend you spell it out as well. Okay. So um, for those of you um, who are who are watching, you can see that there are two different versions of my name on the screen. I did that because I like to make my life difficult. Um, <laughs> so I actually, um, I'm on Instagram under Alwyn Dawn, A-W-Y-N-D-A-W-N. Same thing on X, Twitter, Twixer. Twi we'll, we'll go with Twixer. I think we should all just call it Twixer now. Um, I'm also at Alwyn Dawn. Um, and then I also write under Ash D Collins. So my social media is Ash D underscore Collins. Um, on those, um, I have a website, awandon.com. Um, you know, you can find me around. I'm in places. I do things. I'm also on, on Facebook sometimes if anybody still uses that. I don't because I'm only 27. <laughs> but, um, you know, it's all when gone. It's all went on official, which is a long story because a long time ago they wouldn't give me my name back. So um, it's all went on official on Facebook. Feel free to contact me through those. I also do public speaking engagements. Like I love, um, you know, talking and hearing the sound of my own voice. And I do writing workshops and, you know, all, all, all the fun things. Contact me. I'll come work for you. My uh, uncle does public speaking, but they always tell him to leave the park. <laughs> <laughs> we actually have a speaker's corner in the park here. We're oh, like, really? yeah. So in Hyde Park, there's a place called Speaker's Corner where, and somebody who's been in England longer than me can write in and be like, that's not the truth of it. But my understanding is anybody can go to that corner and talk about anything they want at any time. Really? And that's why, yeah, that's why it's Speaker's Corner. Now, is, does London have a uh, freedom of speech? Do they have that law? Yeah. All right. Well, I, I no, don't know. Canada if it's a, doesn't. I. That's true. 
It's true. Canada <laughs> doesn't. They they have laws that are based on uh, you know certain words you can say and. Stuff like that. I, I, as far as I know, there's there's free speech laws here. I'm a member of like you know free speech union and, and stuff nice. like that over here. So yeah, it's nice. it's good because I I believe that even if what you're saying is stupid, you should have a right to say it. I agree. So we know so we know who to talk to. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like oh, thank you for putting all your cards on the table. <laughs> yeah, no, I'd love to come to your thing schedule with my secretary. I gotta go. Like that please. was one too many K's. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But free speech is so important. Like I, I, I know we're rounding up, but I hear a lot of authors talking about things they can't write about. Yeah. And, and like historically speaking, okay, you look at Shakespeare and Copernicus and like all kinds of writers, like we've Shakes always who? had huh? Shakes who? <laughs> Uh, some guy, he used to write in England. I don't know. Oh, Bill. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, but like people talk about like the, the things that they, that they can't write, but historically speaking, writers have been the truth tellers. We've been the ones who have said the things that people were afraid to say, and it's a sacred duty and we need to keep that going, you know, mm -hmm. say it. Yeah. That people might not like it, but the job of a writer is not to be well liked. I know social media tells you it is, but it's not. It's, it's about art. Write. It's yes, the it's about creation. I mean, they yes. used to paint over paintings in Russia, so you know. Yeah. So, uh, do you really <laughs> want them putting white out on your book? You know. I mean, they have done that to some books where they change the very. But again, you know, like even Dracula was republished by the same author. You know, they rewrote the book a little bit. Uh, J.R. I mean, R.R. Tolkien did the same thing with the Hobbit after the, the the Lord of the Rings series came out. He went back and republished the Hobbit with a with an alternate version of anything that had to do with Gollum, Gollum. You know, so uh, <laughs> um, uh, so it isn't 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 uncommon for books to be republished and changed but when the person is gone mm -hmm. and people leave alone are changing those books yeah it's like you know it's like going well i don't i don't like that uh the mona lisa uh you know she got that smirk on her face yeah i'm gonna, I'm gonna wipe that smirk literally off her face you know or when people <laughs> like put the painting it's so tiny and you're like what it's, it's only big because you see it on the computer <laughs> and it looks really big, but yeah, yeah, canvas was expensive back then. That's right, and size doesn't matter. Trust me. <laughs> I mean, ooh. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, you know, yeah, no art. Art is art is the secret to the soul of the universe and the growth of the person. You know, so uh, if we take away our ability to not necessarily express ourselves like you know you don't want to express hate but if you can express and explore hate through stories or through mm -hmm. art that is now allowing people to have a, a verbal conversation with an emotion because there is a difference between like say uh going back to the k the k joke like uh you know the horrible mentality of a kkk society like that community is right. obviously filled with evil and like right. them to speak rhetoric is terrible but writing a story about their rhetoric and creating like like a narratively emotional view of that society so we can kind of like explore ourselves through even if it's through the uncomfortableness yeah that is something that's important to maintain. Doesn't mean we have to agree and we shouldn't agree with what they're preaching. But if somebody just randomly was like, I want to write a book about that society and that community, as long as they don't write it with a, because even when you're writing narrative, like the book you're writing, like the best way to keep from quote unquote preaching is by presenting multiple perspectives or positions, as I call them. You know, uh, for example, my in one of my books, uh, the character, because I hate fantasy books when like, you know, someone's 18 and they kill somebody and then they kill someone else and they keep and they just mow through people and it doesn't affect them. Right. So something I brought up in it is necessarily is killing right 
some people are like, well, war is war. Other people are like, well, you got to protect yourself. Other people like, so there's so many different perspectives through it yeah. where that when those, the conversations or emotions come up, it's not necessarily preaching like killing is bad. Like it's not just, so if you wrote something uh, as a, uh, as a, uh, I guess a niche as a KKK community kind of exploration, you definitely don't want to make it sound like they're right because that would be horrible. Right. So that's yeah, why yeah. that movie that came out, that was really great. Uh, the black Klansman, you know, by um, uh, what's his name? Oh God. I can't remember. His name. He did. Um, he did. Uh, Inside Man and stuff like that. The director of director. Stan, uh, not, uh, Stan, not Stanley. <laughs> Stanley. Anyway, I apologize. I can't remember the director. I'm, I'm, my brain is just going a thousand miles per hour. But, uh, you know, the Black Klansman is a, based on a true story. It's based on the KKK. It's based on David Duke. It's based on uh, a black detective. It's important that I say he's black because that's the whole point of the movie is to show that this black detective helped take down uh, some area of the KKK and they worked with the police, et cetera, et cetera. So, like, they gave different perspectives, but they had to present the KKK as they were truthfully. And then they presented the other argument and then they presented the community's argument. And that made that movie very powerful because we got to kind of explore our uncomfortableness with the subject. We got to explore the way we see that. We got to have conversations about it with other people in the community, uh, as in the community of our pe peers around us. So yeah, not, <laughs> not that our community. community. Like, not that community. <laughs> you know, but uh, uh, so yeah, I, back, back to the original statements. Art, art is important. It uh, is. It should never be censored, but you know, the freedom of speech you're talking about, I agree in freedom of speech so we could find out who put their cards on the table. You know, like if David Duke is like saying his stuff, we're like, we know not to be friends with that person. But right. That, that is different than art. Yeah. Well, in, in, in art, like there's something so powerful about saying the thing that's right in front of us that we're, we're all faced with every day, but everybody's afraid to mention. Like, mm -hmm you know, like kill or be killed, for example, like, oh yeah, oh no, I would totally kill somebody if they came out from my family. But like, we don't talk about like what that would actually mean though. Yep. How, you know, you it? yeah. And it wouldn't just be like, oh, I killed him. Yeah. yeah that. Nice. Like it, it, it's, it's this, it challenges humanity. And that's, that's mm -hmm. one of the things I love most about writing is you can literally do it, whatever you do with story, as long as you do it well. Yes. And and that right there is why I don't like most romantic films, because they they do the they do two specific tropes. If it's a guy <laughs> POV, the guy walks in on his girlfriend cheating on him and they break up in the beginning of the movie, you know, finding, uh, you know, Sarah Marshall. Or whatever. I've seen That's that movie. Cool. Yeah, what happens? He walks in, she's cheating, right? And he breaks up with her. If it's a girl, she's always in a terrible relationship with somebody and then finds somebody else, cheats on her boyfriend with the better person, and then she finds the strength to leave the original person. And like, let's or stop she, writing that story. <laughs> or, or she needs a visa to, st to stay in the U.S. because she's from Canada. Sandra Bullock and Ryan Reynolds. Yes, that's a good one. What is that two weeks notice? Is that called? Oh no, that's uh, that that's another. The, one. The, the 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 proposal. The proposal. The proposal. That's right. That's right. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but you know, that to me is <laughs> like, why does the girl have to be in a horrible way? and why does the guy have to be like? Why can't they just be single and they find love? You know. Or why can't they find they refine love in themselves? Like they're in relationships falling apart. That's why I really like that movie, Crazy Drunk Love. You ever see that with um, Stephen, uh, uh, the guy who says uh, that's what she said from the office, uh, Steve Stephen Carell, Carell, and then uh, Ryan Gosling is in it. Uh, you know, Emma Stone is in it. Uh, yeah, Marissa yeah, Tomei is in it. Um, Oh, what's her name? She's such an amazing actress too, and I can't believe I'm forgetting her name now. She was in, um, she was in the Big Lebowski, and she she's a redhead, and she was in uh, uh, Boogie Nights. What the hell is her name? Anyway, she was also in the movie. I forget the name of it, but it's about having uh, dementia. Anyway, she's a great actress. I can't believe I don't remember. But Crazy Drunk Love, so good. They they're basically in a relationship. It's a falling apart marriage. That's how it starts off. 
they go and do their separate things and they realize that they love each other and it's about true love and it's about passion and i'm like that that is good that is it, good 50 first dates 50 first dates with uh adam sandler and uh, the, the et et woman uh barry okay. barrymore uh yeah true barrymore barrymore yeah the barrymore profile mm -hmm. uh but yeah i will i will say going back to crazy drunk love <laughs> she does cheat on him in the beginning of the movie and that's why the marriage fails i hate that but the movie does bring them back together so it's not like it's not like it forces the guy to go find another woman and find love like it's actually like they find their way back to each other. And I, that's the part I really love because I like healthy relationships and stories, even if there's tension. Uh, well, but, healthy relationships have tension. Correct. They do. And that's they should, true. because you should be challenging one another, not only to be better, but to challenge change and challenge growth. And uh, not that you should be challenging in a uh, aggressive I'm way. Not to control. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Bring out your son. <laughs> 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 But anyway, I'm sorry. Yes. I, I could go on about this stuff all day, and I apologize. Yeah, yeah, but you know what? Th this is a sign we just need to schedule a second interview. That's what this yeah. is a sign. Cause we'll it's, make it happen. Cause we're we're happen. running into a second interview now. It's like... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're we're halfway through a second episode. Uh, well, you know, you're the last episode of the season, so when I start up oh. next season, we'll get the end for another episode. And the I would love that. Maybe I'll have a fiction book on the way by then, and then we can compare and contrast. Let's do it. Let's do it. I'll, I'll do some developmental editing in real time. <laughs> okay. And I'll be like, no edits. <laughs> no edits. It's perfect. <laughs> it's perfect as it is. It's my baby. Well, remember, great writing is rewriting. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and all great writers have great editors. That's true. Oh my god, my editors on all my books. Mm -hmm. See, so it can't be perfect. First draft is the worst draft, but it is not the last draft. That's how you have to look at it, right? Mm -hmm. It's the dump draft, or really I, usually, I usually send in about the third or fourth draft. That's yeah. That sounds about right. You know. Yeah. When you do the fiction, though, your second draft should be sent to alpha readers, which are really about the uh, functionality of narrative telling. And then by your fourth draft, you send it to beta readers, and that's more about the experience of the reading. And then after you do those notes, your fifth draft should be like something that you kind of could send to your editor. And that's when you start dealing with copy editing and then line or actually line editing and then copy editing. Yeah, I'm glad I don't have that job because you know what? Every time I transfer from Scribner to Word, it's like, you need a comma here. Oh, actually, you don't need a comma here. Actually, you do need a comma. No, you don't need a comma here. I'm like, you know what? I'm not putting a comma there. That's uh, you can you can default to author voice. You can be like, you know what? I'm trying to break up the rhythm of the sentence. This is what I choose. <laughs> I am putting in an Oxford comma, and that is the end of it. <laughs> comma end is important. It's, well, you're in London, so, uh, you know. <laughs> Oxford. <laughs> you need the Oxford comma. Mm. Uh, all right. So, Ash D. Collins, Arwen Dawn, also known as Arwen Dawn. I love that name, by the way. And if I steal it for a character, I'm sorry. Which one, Arwen or Ashley? Just Arwen. <laughs> uh, okay. Because Arwen is mine. A Ash and Ashley, that's my mom. She gets credit for those. Oh, okay. The Ashley. The Ashley. Ash. Uh, one word. Is that short for something? Yes, Ashley. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you already said how to find you, and uh, all her information will be in the description of the video and the episode itself on Spotify and, of course, YouTube. Uh, look at that book. It's so amazing. Uh, it's thank you again so for coming on the show and letting us <laughs> chit and doing some chatting. Uh, it was a pleasure. I had a blast. Thank you. Excellent. And as always, to my audience, uh, you know, you got to keep developing the right mindset. I'll see you next time. Uh, bye.